As most of you know, my previous role was around hacker education with HackerOne, and just recently I have moved to working as VP of Research and Community at Hadrian. So I'm telling you all this because a big portion of my day-to-day -day job was to explain cybersecurity things or hacking or bug bounty terms to people with a non-technical background in sales, marketing, or customer success. And with doing that, I've thought about the fact that there aren't a lot of resources that explain these things in a short format for other people to learn. So with that said, hi, I'm Naham Seg, and today I wanna to talk about OWASP Top 10 2021 and try and teach it to you in under 10 minutes. Before we jump into the video, I wanted to read a message from our sponsor, Detectify. With software evolving faster than ever, it's becoming increasingly difficult to keep track of what you're exposing online and where your organization's weaknesses are. Hackers have long been monitoring the web to find vulnerabilities in places where organizations aren't looking or even know exist. They have eyes and ears where companies don't, and that's where Detectify comes in. Powered by a community of leading ethical hackers, Detectify helps security defenders stay on top of web security and thrive in the digital landscape. It captures, scales, and automates testing with the latest active attack vectors from hackers into your daily development processes. Detectify maps out your growing attack surface and conducts vulnerability tests to find exploitable anomalies across your surface. It goes beyond OWASP top 10 and looks for unknown assets like subdomains to prevent subdomain takeovers alongside third-party software risks. With your attack surface under control, you'll be able to make more informed security decisions and prioritize your scarce security resources. Hacking yourself is the best way to protect your attack surface, so go hack yourself. If you're not familiar with OWASP, OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, also known as OWASP. It's a nonprofit and an online community that creates free available articles, methodologies, documentation, tools, and testing frameworks in the field of web application security. Every few years, OWASP releases a new top 10 category for web vulnerabilities. I think the last one was in 2017. Uh, this one is in 2021. I'm not really a big fan of it. It pretty much tells you what bugs are the most critical or more common vulnerabilities in today's applications. When I say I'm not a big fan of it, it doesn't mean that it's not good, but it means based on my background, I think they could have done a better job of categorizing these uh, in comparison to the last years. But again, it's a great resource for you, especially if you're getting into web application hacking and pen testing. It's a great place to go and you will learn a ton. All right, let's try and do this in 10 minutes. So the first one is broken access control. So imagine you're a part of your company's HR platform. As a employee of the company with someone who doesn't have HR access, you shouldn't be able to see privately identifiable information belonging to other users. So that means you shouldn't be able to see other people's salaries, their social security number, or any other information that's private to them. But what if you could? What if you found a vulnerability where you change a user ID in an API call or in a page where it says 12345 as your user ID and you change that to 123457 instead of your current 123456? and it actually spits out and shows you the information for another user. That could be potentially one of these things that screams broken access control. So think of this as being able to access data that doesn't belong to your user or your user group. It doesn't always have to be about data, it could also be functionality and things that doesn't really belong to you. These types of vulnerabilities could usually happen with a IDOR where you change your object ID by fuzzing an API using brute forces like FFUF or WFUZ or anything else that you use or going as far as tampering your JSON ID or your JSON cookie headers. This type of attack usually happens in a form of an IDOR, for example, when you can change your object ID, when you fuzz for an API and find hidden endpoints, maybe you dig through JavaScript, or you go as far as tampering with your JSON web token and accessing things beyond your resources. If you're a bug bounty hunter, this is a good vulnerability class to learn as it's very common to find these types of vulnerabilities in today's web applications. The second vulnerability class is cryptographic failures. I'm not really sure why this one was ranked as number two. Typically with this type of vulnerability, you want to check and make sure that the server is doing everything it can in its power to protect the data you're sending between you and the web server and its load balancers. So in other words, this could be things like having the proper HTTP headers, sending things in clear text, making sure that it's properly being encrypted, using HTTPS in some cases, and that sort of stuff. As a bug bounty hunter, I don't really think you're gonna really be able to find these kinds of vulnerabilities to get paid for them, as bug bounties more focus on impact versus actual vulnerabilities that are best practices. Third class, and this is probably one of my favorites, it's A3 injections. This one, you may have heard of some of these vulnerabilities, things like a SQL injection, RCE or command or code injection or execution, uh, XSS, anything that you can pretty much execute code onto the server or the web browser. Okay, that was a lot for a vulnerability class. I'm not sure why OWASP put all of these all at once 
but let's break it down. <clears throat> so I mentioned server or browser. Let's talk about server first. A server side vulnerability allows you to serve code or a SQL query, for example, on the host where the actual website is being served to you. So for example, if you find a SQL injection, it allows you to query data from the database and get information about the server itself, the MySQL server, for example, or other users' data. So this is things that are hosted on the server and not actually the user who's looking at this web page. Which brings to the next one, which is the web browser, where it allows you to execute some sort of JavaScript or HTML or malicious code on a user visiting a particular website and you can control their behaviors while they're on that page. So for example, if I have a cross-site scripting in a website and I link you to go to that website, I could do things like change your password, make an order for you, or anything on the browser or target it to a specific user or users that visit that particular web page. As a bug bounty hunter, I think this might be the best one out of them all to really focus on. You have cross-site scripting, you have SQL injection, you have XXC, you have all these server-side vulnerabilities that are very critical and they could pay you out a lot of money. And I'm not saying that because the other vulnerabilities aren't as common. I'm just saying this is more interesting and the criticality level is a lot higher than most of the other categories. Before I jump into the other one, I mentioned that I'm not sure why they've bunched all these vulnerability types together. If you look at the previous version of OWASP Top 10, XSS had its own and it wasn't under injection, but I'm assuming because they wanted to cover more this year, they've actually put this all together and served it under one class. So the last three that I mentioned were not new. They were already a part of the last version of OWASP's Top 10. They were just ranked differently, but this next one is actually new and something that I've introduced in the 2021 version. So let's talk about it. A4, Insecure Design. So this category is really wide and it includes a lot of different vulnerabilities and it's not really looking from a security perspective per se and it's more focused on a design and logic thing but what does that any of it mean imagine if you are trying to buy something from a website and there's only 15 numbers of these items left so let's say you're buying a brand new pair of supreme shoes if you want to waste your money like that you go in there <laughs> i knew you were gonna look at so again there's only 15 items available but what if you ordered 150 it may not sound like it's problematic, but 150 orders of something that only physically is available to 15 people could become problematic. Now imagine if that was like an NFT maybe. Would that be possible to do? But imagine all the different problems that could arise from this issue. Imagine if you could find a way to bypass the limitations and actually change the logic of this website and order more things that is actually available. This could also be the case with coupons. Let's say if you want to change the price on something, something's supposed to be $29.99. What if you change it to 99 cents? These are things that could happen with this vulnerability type. If you're doing this for bug bounty hunting, I think it's really, really easy to find these vulnerabilities. They're still very common in some cases, but always ask yourself, what is this application supposed to do logically? And can I make it do exactly the opposite of that? Can I make it do more than it's supposed to? Can I order more items or whatever it is that you're working on? Think of the logic of that business and see if you can find a flaw in that logic that could cost that company money or resources or anything else that could be a business issue and something that could go back to the logic of the application. So again, this is also pretty broad. Like I said in the last one, I know I keep saying that, but this is something that could cover a lot of different vulnerability types. So security misconfiguration could refer to things like leaving unnecessary functionality behind, leaving default credentials, on an application or things that are not supposed to be exposed to the regular users. So just to explain this easier, think about a web port that is not supposed to be publicly accessible. Or think of a new application you install for your company and it comes with hardcoded credentials that are admin and password. Those are things that attackers will find and exploit in order to get access to that system and exploit or elevate their accesses further. A really good example of this that I've also came across is a Tomcat web server. Imagine you install a Tomcat to launch a new application for your company and then you forget to remove all the default files and configurations that comes with it. This could play out in a number of different ways with vulnerabilities, but two are very, very common that I have seen personally. And the two are very, very similar. One is that the attackers either brute force for these username and passwords, they don't know what the username and password is, but they're brute force for it because the login is available. Or two, you install it with a default username and password, like Tomcat as a username and nothing for the password, which is really common, more than common than you think or things that are easier to guess. So Tomcat and password, Tomcat and blank password, and so on. 
If you're a bug bounty hunter and you're watching this, I really recommend also looking into this as a lot of these applications either come with default functionalities that are not supposed to be exposed or actually have default credentials that you can find by reading the documentation on their websites. Okay, we're halfway through the video. If you're still here with me, do me a favor. If you haven't done it already, subscribe to the channel and like the video down below and let me know if you actually like this kind of content and what you've liked about it so far. A6, vulnerable and outdated components. In my last example, I talked about Tomcat and I probably should have explained that Tomcat is used to run Java applications in a lot of cases. And just like any other software, Tomcat is also known to have a lot of vulnerabilities. And they're not the only ones. Every day there are new vulnerabilities and ODAs being dropped for popular softwares like Jira, the GitHub Enterprise, Jenkins, Grafana, you name it. All of these have vulnerabilities and in a lot of cases you can find these vulnerabilities and their proof of concept or working POC on GitHub or exploit databases like ExploitDB. So what does that actually mean? Well, it is exactly what it sounds like, but just to break it down, it's hackers finding applications that have known vulnerabilities out there and leveraging it to getting into the company's infrastructure. If you can think of any news articles, the recent Struts2, Heartbleed, and those vulnerabilities are some of the bigger ones that made headlines in the recent years. As a bug bounty hunter, this is also another good one to look into, especially since you can automate a lot of this work. So in other words, you can leverage recon frameworks that are out there on GitHub or tools like Nucle to write a template, find his applications, and report them to the bug bounty programs. And also, if you like these kinds of vulnerabilities, I host a show every Sunday where I bring a guest where we talk about recon and how to do these things in depth and in details, and we do an interview around them. So you can come check it out on Sundays on twitch.tv slash nahomsek identification and authentication failures. I think I got this one right. So this vulnerability class also covers a few different methods of hacking. The most common one that I think is very much realistic is where an attacker is able to obtain working credentials on a particular application. And it's usually done in two commonly done ways. The first one is an easy one that we have already talked about is brute forcing for credentials. The attacker knows the username and they hope that it has a weak password or something they can guess or somewhere in their word list to have that password, the brute force for it, and if it works, that gives them a set of working credentials. A second one, however, is a little bit more complicated, but it's not harder if, per se, which is called credential stuffing. This one is also another automated way to obtain a set of credentials similar to brute forcing, but instead of brute forcing for the passwords, it's relying on a previously known breach when another company has been hacked and they get those usernames and passwords and they try it against the entire infrastructure in hopes that it works. Identification and authentication failures doesn't just end here. It also covers things like session fixations, exposing a token or your API key in the URL bar, or allowing to reuse cookies or sessions from a previously successful login. A8, which is software and data integrity failures. Don't know what it means. So this is actually one of the newer classes that was introduced in the 2021 top 10. The explanation on the OWASP slide kind of makes sense, but I'm going to try and explain it in the easier terms. This class actually refers to using third-party libraries or using software from untrusted resources like GitHub or projects that anybody could contribute to. Do you remember a few years ago where SolarWinds was hacked and it became a big deal? Well, it was a big deal because the attackers were able to hack SolarWinds from what I remember, and they had the ability to push malicious updates to their customers. But when that happens, you're actually able to push malicious code into an update and distribute it to other companies. It gives you access wherever the software is being served. So this could happen pretty much if you're not verifying these updates or if you're using unreliable GitHub projects that anybody could commit code to. So in other words, you really want to understand how this company deploys code, what projects they use, and find a way to tamper with their CI CD pipeline and find a way to inject code into those updates on those resources that's being leveraged by this company. I think if I wanted to think about a good bug bounty example of this, we can talk about Alex Bursar. I think that's how we say his name. If you're watching this, I'm sorry for butchering your name, but he did some good research on dependency confusion and I highly recommend you checking it out on his website, on his Medium blog, where he talks about similar approaches to this vulnerability class. A9 is security logging and monitoring failures. So this is not actually an attack type, but it's the capability for a company to know whether or not an attack is incoming. So do they have this proper security measures to see something malicious is coming after the infrastructure, either during a pen test or some sort of an attack. So this could include things like the ability to log failed attempts on login pages, capturing all the traffic that's going through your API or the actual web server in case of an attack and being able to see the logs. So again, in short, 
It's the capability of seeing an attack incoming, detecting it, and being able to prepare the organization against a particular attack. All right, last but not least, and this is the last one we're gonna talk about, A10, and I think they kept the best for last, which is server-side request forgery, also known as SSRF, which is also one of my favorite vulnerability types. If you haven't seen it already, you can actually go on this channel and look at some of the SSRF talks I've done. I've also presented at a bunch of different conferences on how to own the cloud with PDF generators and SSRF. I've done a whole research on it, so go ahead and check it out and let me know what you think, but I'm gonna try and explain what SSRF really means. So think of SSRF as having access with a computer sitting in a network belonging to a company. SSRF is a vulnerability that allows an attacker to make a request to an application that it's not intended to. So that means that this particular resource could be sitting behind a firewall or it requires a VPN or it's only accessible within a trusted resource. So this means getting access to internal tooling that's only accessible within the company's infrastructure. SSRF could happen in a lot of different flavors. It's not always with web services. It could also be things like an API that's internal. It could be with the cloud infrastructure or the metadata with that cloud infrastructure or anything that it actually requires you to be a part of the infrastructure itself. A server-side request forgery allows an attacker to force the application to interact with a location that is unintended. So in other words, it allows the hacker to pull data from resources or web services that are within the internal network of a particular company. Think about it this way, when you log into a company's VPN, it opens up access to a ton of different websites that it's only accessible if you're on that VPN. So if you hack into an application with an SSRF and that application is sitting on the internal network, it could give you the ability to actually make requests to another web server or pull data from it. It doesn't always have to be a web server. This could also be things on the local machine itself. So it could be files on the local machine or it could be interacting with the AWS Azure or whatever cloud service they're using and pulling data from their internal services. So that could include things like AWS keys, it could be reading local files or going as far as making a request to an internal API and fetching credentials that's only accessible within that company's infrastructure. SSRFs are very, very common. It could happen a ton of different ways. If you're a bug bounty hunter, if you're someone that's getting into web pen testing, this is very, very good resource to look into. It's a very critical vulnerability. It can be escalated very quickly and I highly recommend you looking into it. Okay, so now that I'm done with the video, this was actually more challenging than I thought it would be. It's not really easy to break these things down and explain it in 10 minutes. I don't know if we did it in 10 minutes. Hopefully we did, but I really hope that this all makes sense and I hope you guys enjoyed this content. But before I let you guys go, I wanna talk about resources where you can actually practice a lot of these. As I mentioned earlier, this is the top 10 for 2021. There aren't a lot of resources for hands-on learning, but the 2017 version, the previous one, it's actually pretty popular. I like it more than this year's. Again, I don't have a problem with the 2021 version. I just like 2017's better. So if you wanna learn these hands-on, first of all, OWASP itself has this thing called Juice Shop. If you type in OWASP Juice Shop, it will come up. You can install it or get a Docker image of it and look at it and it will tell you how to look for these vulnerabilities. It's a lab that I've created. It's very, very good. I highly recommend it. The other two options you have are Hack the Box. I think they still have a retired machine on OWASP Top 10. And I know Try Hack Me has an entire room dedicated to learning the previous version of OWASP Top 10 which is also a great resource. All right, that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed this content. Do me a favor, hit the like button. Also drop me a comment and let me know what you think. And I will see you all in the next video.